This series from The Conversation is supported by the National Centre for Social Research, NATSEN, the largest independent and not-for-profit social research organisation in the UK. So I'm here at the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. The Labour conference happens once a year and is a chance for MPs, party members and interest groups to come together to discuss the big issues of the day. I've been coming here for quite a few years at this point, but this is the first conference I've ever been to where Labour's been in government and it feels very different. The atmosphere at the 2024 meeting was serious. There were lots of think tankers running around in suits, tired looking lobbyists trying to grab the attention of new ministers and a surprising lack of the party atmosphere that you might expect after the election victory in July. New Prime Minister Keir Starmer was there too, obviously, and he gave his slightly depressing big speech. The trouble is, conference, just as we found with the Labour Party four years ago, Britain is no longer sure of itself. Our story is uncertain. The hope beaten out of us. I'm off to a fringe meeting to hear from some trade union leaders about how they feel the Labour Party and the Labour government is representing the Labour movement. I mean, those of us who believe in an understanding of class is essential to win any improvements in the lives of working people are often pillared uh, by more sensible voices as uh, class warrior dinosaurs, as if the concept is, is outdated. That's Daniel Kebedi of the National Education Union speaking at a session on bringing back class politics. The audience was listening intently, despite showing signs of conference fatigue and potentially more than a few hangovers at this early 10am meeting. Now there are millions of ex-Labour voters who feel that the party has, has deserted them, that it no longer represents the interests of working people. For many, the party is made up of uh, and overwhelmingly represents the interests of middle and higher classes, perhaps with some justification. And could see a battle of the Trades Union Congress reminded attendees of the historical ties between Labour and the unions. The Labour Party and the Labour movement, our movement, must be the true champions of all workers, united in our shared fight for better wages, fair conditions and respect for every individual, no matter who they are. And the relationship between the Labour Party and our Labour movement is critical to building a fairer society. In that morning fringe meeting over coffee, there was a strong sense that something which has been broken should and must be fixed with the Labour Party that is now in government. And as Big Ben strikes 10, the exit poll is predicting a Labour landslide. We are seeing Labour demolish the Conservatives. Oh, oh. oh my God. Oh. <laughs> a Labour landslide and then some. There are currently more than 400 Labour MPs and just over 120 Conservatives. It's a very big change on the Conservative dominance of recent years. We don't yet have a full analysis of the socio-economic background of those MPs, but the Sutton Trust has already calculated that the proportion of privately educated MPs is at a record low in almost 50 years of monitoring, they now only make up 23% of MPs. That's still pretty far from the general population, where only 7% of people go to private school. But there's reason to hope that the Parliament is ever so slightly more representative of the world outside it. That's a big deal, because for quite some time, there has been hardly any working class representation at all. Sharing that lived experience is really important in terms of just realising what's salient and important to people. You don't have to have had that lived experience to make that connection, but it's a lot easier. Rosie Campbell is Professor of Politics at King's College London. Among many other things, she studies how different groups are represented in politics. She says that in turn, that representation can lead to real political change. 
I think it's an exact parallel with the absence of women in politics historically. It's very difficult to prove that an individual woman makes a difference. But if you think about since we've had more women in politics, things like childcare, things like violence against women and girls have become mainstream issues that are discussed at election time in a way they absolutely would not have been in the past. And I think it's having those voices present changes the debate, changes the narrative for everyone, puts things on the table that otherwise may not have been discussed. The role of Parliament is literally to represent the people of the United Kingdom. In recent years, we've come to understand that having more women and more people of different ethnic heritage makes for better representation. It's partly why we've made progress on equality. So how clear is the link between representation and political change? Will this new look Parliament herald meaningful change? I'm Laura Hood, Senior Politics Editor at The Conversation UK. This is episode four of Know Your Place, What Happened to Class in British Politics. The estate I grew up on in Winsford was a good, solid council house, but it had a very strong community around it. David Hanson is a former Labour MP and current government minister sitting in the House of Lords. People from his background have been quite a rare sight in the House of Commons for some time. He grew up in a working class family in Winsford in northwest England. I was surrounded by trade unionists. I was surrounded by people involved in the Labour Party. I was surrounded by people who faced great poverty. You know, I would see the real impacts of people who were working in factories and Sometimes you'd wake up in the morning and the neighbour across the road had left the house overnight and done what we used to call a moonlight flip because they'd gone because of poverty and debts chasing them. You know, the local Labour councillor lived at the back of where we lived and I joined the Labour Party through meeting the local Labour councillor. I never saw a Tory poster until I went to university. David and his family went through some difficult times. My mum um, was born in 1933. She caught tuberculosis in 1948, 1949. She had her lung removed because of tuberculosis. was in a sanatorium between 1950 and when she met my dad in 1953. And, uh, you know, she used to say to me, without the National Health Service, she would have been dead. Simple as that. I wouldn't have been born. My family wouldn't have existed. My dad wouldn't have had a 54-year marriage with my mum. And these experiences had a profound impact on his politics. What made me want to be a Labour MP was my background. When I eventually get to Parliament, the things that mattered to me were things like the minimum wage, things like ensuring that we had community cohesion and support for proper council housing, things like regeneration, things like support for the health service for the experiences I mentioned earlier. Who is elected matters for what they do once they get elected. Vladimir Borton is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oxford and specialises in the study of political elites. He recently spent hours interviewing 24 different former MPs, all of whom came from working class backgrounds and were in Parliament between 1974 and 2019. And just as in David's case, he found that a person's class origin very much shaped their political outlook. We found out that it's not just the parental direct influence, which is usually assumed as as the class origins, but also the wider family, the, the broader family network. In some cases, it was the grandfather or even the great-grandfather that exerted an influence in the political socialization of people. But it's also the local community, especially for working-class MPs, who grew up on council estates in working class communities where everybody knew everybody. Uh, many people worked in the same place together. There was this, this strong collective uh, bond and uh, community spirit. This also played a massive role in their political upbringing. And uh, I think it's important to note this because many of these communities have eroded in the past few decades. Communities like the one David grew up in. Now, I went to university, I was the first kid from my house to go to university, so am I working class? I still regard those 18 years of my life on council estate with my parents and my parents' background as what's coloured my political views. University helped entrench them, but that's what's coloured my political views. I went to university as a Labour Party supporter, 
and I got more energized and engaged at university. But had I not had that first 18 years, I wouldn't have had that input in the first place. David got to Parliament in 1992 and found himself gravitating towards the MPs who shared his background. I tended to get engaged and mixed with people who had had perhaps similar backgrounds to me, but we, we tended to be a year group. So the 1992 intake, which I was, people in that had various different outlooks. One of my best friends was a former car worker, shop steward at Coventry, Jaguar plant, another was a former coal miner, but equally I had other people who had been teachers and other activities. So it was it was very much mixing in with the people in our 92 intake. And again, a lot of people I, I knew had had similar backgrounds to me in the sense that they were what I would call middle class rather than middle class. They'd been working class kids who'd gone to university, who'd got into the professional lives, but they were still basically you know, kids from council estates or kids from working class backgrounds. But they'd become middle class by the nature of their professions. And before I was parliament, I was director of a charity. I'd been a, a regional manager and a senior manager for a charity. I'd been a regional manager for the co-op. So my working life is not what I would call a working class life that my dad had or the people I grew up with had. But that still is an imprint on my life, even now today. I like the term muddle class. That, that really, I think that applies to a lot of the people we've been talking to in this project and this difficulty in deciding, you know, when you stop being one class and, and start being another. No, no, and... no, well, I, I will never stop being working class. Yeah. In 1945, roughly a quarter of the MPs elected then had working class background, understood in this occupational sense that they had some kind of working class occupation before entering parliament, whereas in 2019, half a century later, or more than half a century, only 7%. So there's been this um, gentrification of, uh, of politics. Between 1959 and 1992, the number of working class Labour MPs declined, but only very gradually, at a rate of something like 10% over those 30 years. But then it dropped off a cliff. In just one parliamentary session between 1992 and 1997, it fell another 10%. Like so many other parts of this story, Tony Blair's new Labour years were pivotal. Ask me my three main priorities for government. And I tell you, education, education and education. <laughs> One of the things that's really happened in our politics is that almost all of our politicians have university degrees. Rosie Campbell again, Professor of Politics at King's College London. So even if they do think of themselves as coming from a working class background, by the time they've entered politics, they have had quite a different life experience from the average working class person in this country. Keir Starmer and his Chancellor Rachel Reeves are no exceptions. Keir Starmer may be the son of a toolmaker, but he's also someone who worked as a barrister, which is a, an elite profession. He's someone who's been socialized and re-socialized in the state apparatus as a public prosecutor. And uh, Rachel Reeves, she worked for the Bank of England. She also went to Oxford before that. And I'm saying this as someone who works at Oxford. So we have to be aware that people change over their life trajectory. And despite the fact that their class origins may still play a role in shaping their outlook, and they, they still may differentiate them from political elites from a more privileged background. So I'm not saying here that Starmer and Reeves are exactly the same like Sunak and Osborne or Cameron. I think they are different, but they are different in the same framework of neoliberal capitalism. Part of the problem is that politics has become a rich person's game. It takes time and money to run for parliament, and it's a process that can take years. That's not something that's possible for many people in this economy. And since an MP's background inevitably shapes their political activities, it's easy to see why the House of Commons feels out of touch. <laughs> If you like this podcast, you might also enjoy Quiet Riot, the politics podcast that lowers the temperature to increase the warmth. 
Every week, Alex Andreu and Naomi Smith, with expert guests and familiar voices from left and right, make their way through the news, seeking to build consensus rather than amplify differences, and give you, the listener, calls to action, so that democracy is something you do, not something done to you. Quiet Riot. More passion, less shouting. It's worth focusing on the Conservative Party a bit too. Their working class representation hasn't declined like Labour's, because it's pretty hard to decline from practically none in the first place. We've gotten used to Conservative MPs sounding like this. Well, I'm certainly not part of the aristocracy. That's definitely true. So we settle for upper middle? I'm a man of the people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's Jacob Rees-Mogg, of course, who just lost his seat in the 2024 election. Oh, I think I know what my mother would say. I think she'd look across the dispatch box and she'd say, put on a proper suit, do up your tie and sing the national anthem. David Cameron, former Prime Minister, infamous for calling the Brexit referendum he didn't believe in. But over the years, there have at least been some working class MPs among the Tory ranks. We interviewed the conservative MPs that came from working class backgrounds who said that because they grew up in working class uh, settings, they aspired to have more in life. They wanted to have a, a better economic and social situation than their parents, which led them towards a more entrepreneurial, individualist kind of mindset, which drew them towards the Conservative Party. But even then, in relation to other conservative MPs from more privileged backgrounds, they felt different. They felt that they were maybe a bit more sympathetic towards um, ordinary people. In the case of one of them who rebelled against the party line sometime during the 1980s over a dispute on nurses' pay. The party line was to reject the increase in the nurses' pay at the time, and he rebelled against that because he had the experience of his mother being on low pay when he was growing up. Over the course of his interviews, Vlad spoke to many MPs who came up against the party machine when trying to stay true to their working class roots. The reality of Parliament is that you rarely get to vote with your conscience on legislation. The decision making in Parliament is very centralised. It's very top down. And the MPs, more often than not, just toe the party line. For example, one of them in um, the case of an austerity policy that the Labour Party opposed in the 2010-2015 legislature, he justified his vote against that policy in terms of his attachment to his uh, constituency, a working class constituency where he came from himself, he grew up in that constituency, he knew the people, he had a personal connection to them, and he, he could see how that austerity policy would impact those people directly. And that's how he justified, at least to me, the, the vote against that policy. But it also happened to be a policy that his party opposed, and the, the, the party line was to vote against that policy. In another instance, though, another austerity policy in the same legislature, the party line, for some reason, was to abstain, not vote against it, and he abstained. And he said that in that case, defying the party line and voting against the policy rather than abstaining would have been uh, virtue signaling. He didn't want to be a virtue signaling rebel. So I think it highlights the, the certain performativity that some of uh, the political elites may engage in when they talk about their uh, political behavior. But also, I think it uh, emphasizes the dominant role of the party line and party discipline. And I think we've seen very recently, in, in the case of the Labour Party, how what the repercussions can be if you defy the, the party line. The Prime Minister suspended seven left-wing Labour MPs who voted with Scottish nationalists to abolish the two-child limit on benefit payments. Just days into the new parliamentary term, Keir Starmer suspended a group of seven MPs who voted against his party line. The group was calling for Starmer to repeal the two-child benefit cap, a policy implemented by the Conservatives which limits claims for certain state benefits to a maximum of two children per household. So if you have a third, you're on your own. This has been widely criticised for tipping working-class families into poverty. 
And uh, in this case, it's a bit strange because the party line is being shaped by someone who is leading the party and is leading the government who talks about his working class background. He talks about how important his class origins are to him. This was obviously not a great start for a parliament representing a nation that is struggling financially. But it would be unfair to say the Labour Party isn't thinking about these issues and is not aware of the need to deliver. People are going to turn around in five years' time and say, are we better off than we were five years ago? Jeevan Sander was elected as Labour MP for Loughborough in 2024 after completing his PhD on the political and economic causes of income inequality and poverty. He's adamant that the new government is taking a longer view on addressing these problems. Are our incomes higher? Is the NHS working? If they're a young person, have I been more able to have financial security because my housing costs aren't so high? Those are going to be, I think, the key questions at the next election. And look, you point out, I was like, I'm in a bellwether seat. Like, either we're going to improve and deliver, or I'm out of a job. And it really is as simple as that. And while class representation is important, action is realistically what will win the next election. If class is about your financial security or financial well-being, then class is a lot more about wealth and our offer to working class communities who don't own or working class people who are renters because they are the least financially secure, we are offering to build a lot more homes. So that's on the individual level. In terms of communities that are outside of major cities that have maybe seen relative economic declines since deindustrialization, you can also see what we want to do here, which is GB Energy, the National Wealth Fund, investing in the green energy transition to rebuild and restructure communities and provide a way forward. The difference will come down to moving beyond the performance of working class credentials and towards something more meaningful. It's worth noting here that David Hansen, the former MP who we heard from earlier, has been brought into the House of Lords by the new Prime Minister to work in his government. That's not nothing. And conference, 12 months ago, I stood there and said I hoped I'd never again open conference as the deputy leader of the opposition. So it's an absolute great honour of my life to stand here today as your deputy Prime Minister. That's Angela Rayner at this year's Labour conference. In her, Starmer has a powerful force by his side. She's a working class woman who came up through the unions and absolutely refuses to change. I think class is a really significant issue in this country and I won't stop talking about it until we break down some of those barriers that we face. Raina grew up on a council estate and left school at 16. She has spoken about how her mum had not been equipped to teach her to read and write. She has experienced life as a school leaver, a teenage mother, and as a woman working long shifts on zero hours contracts. I think she's incredibly important. Rosie Campbell again. Having had lived experience, such as Angela Raina has, of growing up in what sounds like a very challenging environment, you're going to have empathy and understanding of the experiences of other people going through similar life chances. And I think having more people who've had that kind of experience in politics can only be a good thing. But of course, if you've got experience of working in a particular sector, you understand it better or you're better connected to it than if you if you just worked in politics all your life. So my view is it's about diversity of experience diversity of employed experience, diversity of childhood experiences. When we start to see one group being overrepresented, it's a problem because actually we need to be having a conversation with people who've got the full spectrum of experiences that we have in Britain today. Mm -hmm. And do we have evidence that that matters more to certain voters than others? Like, Do working class voters care more about who their MPs are than non-working class voters or do we not know? What we found is that everyone prefers the kind of politician who's got experience working outside of politics. Actually, a politician who hasn't gone on to university is more popular overall, considered more approachable. So 
I'm not sure it's such a simple binary thing as people looking for someone just like them in politics. But I certainly think what can happen in a more aggregate way is if you don't see anybody like you, you can feel as if this isn't for you and that you are not represented. What voters want obviously matters in any democracy, but there's something about this moment that makes it extra important. I I know that perhaps we're all a bit cynical about the toolmaker point because we've heard it such a lot, but actually, you know, we follow politics very avidly. And one thing that has happened is we know that trust in politics has declined over time and that there are more people who think, have a sort of populist view that politicians are only in it for themselves and they've got no ordinary lived experience. And I think for politicians, plural, to remind voters of actually, you know, they're ordinary people, they have faced challenges, is helpful because we need to have that connection between voters and politicians. And that connection definitely matters in elections. Jeevan Sander again, current Labour MP. There is another story at the last election, which is there are no safe seats anymore. Mm. And you saw some very surprising results. You know, some of my colleagues who I really value lost their seats and, and we were very surprised. And so because of that, you are very aware of the fact that people are not people are not walking into the voting booth going, oh, I love the red team, I love the blue team. Like, this has changed. And if Labour and the Conservatives can't connect with working class voters, there are others who are very eager to take their place. Guess who's back? (laughs) Back again. (laughs) Our aim and our ambition is to become a real opposition to a Labour government. Nigel Farage. In the final episode of Know Your Place from the Conversation Documentaries, we're heading into the future. This podcast was written by me, Laura Hood, and our producer, Anouk Mie. She also mixed the series. Our executive producer is Gemma Ware. If you'd like to get in touch, please email us at podcast at theconversation.com and do sign up to our Friday afternoon briefing, Politics Weekly, an essential analysis of the biggest stories in British politics to take you into the weekend. Subscribe via the link in our show notes. This series is a production of The Conversation, a not-for-profit news organisation working with academics to share their knowledge with the general public. If you like what we do, please consider donating to The Conversation by going to donate.theconversation.com. Thank you again to the National Centre for Social Research for supporting this series. And thank you for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, check out The Conversation Weekly. It's a show where leading experts around the world connect their research to the biggest trends, ideas and issues of today. I'm the host, Gemma Ware, and each week I get to talk to academics about the fascinating discoveries they're using to make sense of the world around us. We ask questions like, what's going on in our brains when we're in a state of creative flow? The most experienced musicians had a network of brain areas in the left hemisphere that was associated with a high state of flow. We find out what seals are telling us about the melting of Antarctic glaciers. We can get a vertical profile of the water property in every dive that they have. And we find out what happened to Nelson Mandela's South Africa. Our expectations of what could have been done in the past are too high, but then our expectations of what we should be reimagining in the present for the future are too low. Follow The Conversation Weekly for new episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcasts, or find us on theconversation.com.